The message of true Christianity is Christ crucified, risen, and coming again. Christ isn't finished. He isn't finished with us. He promised to come and take us home to himself, to give us eternal life with him. And he isn't finished with this world. Just as God stepped into human affairs in the past to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and destroy the world of Noah's day, Jesus is coming again to deal with this world that rejects him as king. This is a key element of the gospel that Paul and the other apostles preached, but it is not popular today to speak of Christ coming again, even in many churches. Jesus was crucified, he died for our sins, and then he rose again from the grave, leaving behind an empty tomb. After that, Jesus appeared alive to his followers over the course of several weeks. History records that there were more than 500 eyewitnesses that Jesus had risen from the dead and was alive again. Then, as his disciples watched, he rose into the sky until he disappeared from their sight. As we read in Acts 1.11, two angels told Jesus' followers, You men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has received up from you into the sky will come back in the same way as you saw him going into the sky. Jesus himself had often spoken to his disciples about his return, his second coming. It will not be like his humble birth as a baby wrapped in swaddling bands and laid in a manger. Christ's return won't be like his submissive death on the cross. Rather, Jesus said he will return with great power and glory. At Mark chapter 13, beginning with verse 26, Jesus said, Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out his angels and will gather together his chosen ones from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the sky. Jesus will return as King of the Kingdom of God. When he was on trial before the High Court of the Jews, and the High Priest demanded to know whether Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God, Matthew 26, 64 tells us, Jesus said to him, After this you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of the sky. Jesus knew that the religious leaders of the Jews would understand this to be a reference to the book of Daniel, where Daniel used that expression, son of man, to foretell the king who would rule forever over all mankind. In Daniel chapter 7, we read, I saw the night in the night visions, and behold, there came with the clouds of the sky one like a son of man, and he came even to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him. There was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Jesus devoted a significant portion of his teaching to the subject of his return. Many of his parables are devoted to that theme, describing how people would be caught by surprise and how they would be rewarded or punished at that time. For example, there's the parable of the ten virgins, the wise and foolish virgins, the parable of the talents, and the parable of the sheep and the goats. These all deal with what will happen when Christ returns. When the bridegroom arrives, the wise virgins who are ready are welcomed in to the feast, while the foolish virgins who are unprepared find the door shut. The servants with the talents are either rewarded or punished when the master returns. When Christ returns, he separates people, like a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Jesus encouraged us in Matthew's Gospel to keep watch for his coming. He said, Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. Be ready, because the Son of Man will come 
at an hour when you do not expect him. We can be ready by living the way the Bible teaches us to live, and we can keep watch by eagerly praying for Christ's return and by paying attention to world events that point to the imminence of his coming. Which events? I believe those events that signify the approach of Jesus' coming include destructive coastal storms, tsunamis, weird weather, and climate change, the world becoming like Sodom and Gomorrah, Jerusalem being under Jewish control as it has been since 1967, after 2,000 years of no Jewish control there, and Jerusalem the focus of world tension as it is today with Jerusalem coming into the headlines as different countries vie for control and as the nations struggle as to who is going to control Jerusalem, whose capital is it going to be? And also another sign would be inflation and shortages of basic commodities as spelled out in the book of Revelation and many other things that Jesus and the apostles said to watch for. When Jesus told his disciples about the coming destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, they asked him about the timing and the events to watch for. Reading from the King James Version of Matthew 24, 3, it says, As he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Jesus answered them with a lengthy discussion of future world events. His answer is recorded to us in Matthew chapters 24 and 25, in Mark chapter 13, and in Luke chapters 17 and 21. The disciples actually asked a three-part question. First, when shall these things be? The things Jesus had just spoken about to them in connection with the Roman armies destroying Jerusalem and its temple so that there wouldn't be one stone left upon another there and scattering the Jewish people worldwide. And the second part of their question had to do with what shall be the sign of thy coming? And the third part, they said, and the end of the world. Jesus answered all three parts of their question. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, providing different details in each one of the Gospels as to what Jesus said. The apostles also elaborated on end times events in their letters found in the New Testament as they wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And the Old Testament prophets, too, wrote at length on these matters. I've produced a number of books, full-length studies on these end times prophecies. These are books that can be read in print, or you can also read them for free or download them for free, most of them at, uh, digital, in digital form at BibleNook.com. But even a simple reading of the Bible gives those who are keeping watch good reason to believe that Jesus will return very soon. Just think of the time when God rained down fire and brimstone on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, or the time when God sent the flood of Noah's day to destroy a whole world and save just a handful of people in Noah's ark. We can learn from God's past interventions in human affairs when mankind's behavior deteriorated to the point that God forcefully put a stop to it. Has our world today reached the level of violence that prompted God to destroy the pre-flood world? Are people today behaving like the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah? Has our technological advancement resulted in attitudes like those of the people who are building the Tower of Babel? Then we have reason to be in eager expectation of Christ's return. The Apostle Peter in his second letter gives us an example of what the Apostles taught about Jesus coming again. Let's read a portion from 2 Peter chapter 3 beginning with the third verse. <clears throat> Most importantly, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. Where is the promise of his coming, they will ask. Ever since our fathers fell asleep, everything continues 
as it has from the beginning of creation. But they deliberately overlooked the fact that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world of that time perished in the flood. And by that same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Beloved, do not let this one thing escape your notice. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and its works will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to conduct yourselves in holiness and godliness as you anticipate and hasten the coming of the day of God. So Peter challenges us, since Christ's return will be so world-changing, what kind of people are we to be? Does all of this mean that you should quit your job, stop mowing your front lawn, and spend your time parading downtown carrying a poster that proclaims the end is near? No, but it may call for other adjustments on your part. As individuals, we may or may not live to see Christ come again, to take the whole church home to him and to destroy this wicked world. But each of us will definitely live to see him come again to take us home individually. It's nearly 2,000 years since Christ went to heaven, but no believer has had to wait more than a lifetime to be called home to Jesus. Since we know that Christ is coming again, and since we know he may come for us as individuals even before his second coming, Peter asks us, what sort of people ought we to be? Is there some unfinished business between you and God? Have you been putting it off? If so, then the things we're discussing should make you reconsider your priorities. There may not be time to leave God until later. Instead of leaving God waiting in the wings, you may need to reorder your life's interests so as to move your relationship with God to center stage. Time is running out for this world that's in rebellion against God. And time may be running out for you and me personally. You don't have to become a theologian in order to please God. I remember the wisdom of a lady who spoke to me after church one evening. She said, I didn't get to know God through any school of theology. I got to know God through the school of neology. In other words, it was through the time she spent on her knees in prayer that she got to know God. God is not looking for intellectuals. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty-five, 25, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. So you don't need to study deeply about Christ's coming again. You don't need to grasp all the details of history and prophecy. You just need to put your trust in Jesus as your Savior and obey him as your Lord. Leave the rest to him. He will do the things he promised to bless those who follow him and to punish this corrupt world. The world around us has fallen into the condition of the world that provoked the flood of Noah's day. The world around us has fallen into the condition of the world that provoked divine intervention at the Tower of Babel. The world around us has fallen into the condition of the world that brought down fire and brimstone from heaven in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. The time ahead of us will see the sudden return of Jesus Christ and the sudden rapture of his church to join him in heaven and God's final war, the Battle of Armageddon. The Bible contains all the details, but we may not be able to puzzle them all out ahead of time. Still, we can discern enough to trust that God knows exactly what will happen and that he has declared what the final outcome will be. Our job is to trust and obey. By putting faith in Jesus, 
We can face the frightening days ahead with joy and gladness instead of fear and terror. In Luke chapter 21, Jesus talked about the things that would happen just before he returns, frightening things. And in verse 28, he said, when these things begin to take place, stand erect, hold your heads high, because your liberation is at hand. As we see these frightening things happening in the world around us, let's lift up our heads. Christ is coming again. Let's join the faithful everywhere in saying, Come, Lord Jesus.